Chapters 17 and 18 of Stories from Virgil. Chapters 17 and 18. Chapter 17 The Gathering of the Chiefs. After this, the shepherds hasted back to the city and bear with them the dead, even the youth Almo, and the old man Galesus, and cried for vengeance to the gods and to the king. And fiercest of all was Turnus, complaining that men of Troy were called to reign over them, and that he himself was banished. And all the multitude was urgent with the king that he should make war against the strangers. Neither did any man regard the commands of the gods. But the king stood firm even as a great rock in the sea is not moved, though the waves roar about it, and the seaweed is dashed upon its sides. But when he saw that he could not prevail against these evil counsels, he called the gods to witness, crying, The storm strikes upon me, and I may not stand against it. O foolish Latins, ye shall pay for this madness with your blood, and thou, Turnus, shalt suffer the worst punishment of all and when thou shalt turn to the gods they shall not hear thee. But as for me, my rest is at hand. I lose but the honours of my funeral." It was a custom in Latium, which Alba kept in after time, and mighty Rome yet keepeth to this day, that when she beginneth to make war, be it on the men of Thrace, or the men of the East, Arab, or Indian, or Parthian, they open the great gates of the temple, double they are, and made strong with bolts of brass and iron. On the threshold whereof sitteth Janus, the guardian, for the consul himself, with robe and girdle, so soon as fathers give their sentence for war, throws them wide, and the people follow the consul, and the horns blow a great blast together. Even so they bade King Latinus, after the custom of his country, declare war against the men of Troy, and open the gates of slaughter. But he would not, flying and hiding himself in darkness. Then did great Juno herself come down and burst asunder the iron-bound gates of war. Then through the land of Italy men prepared themselves for battle, making bright shield and spear and sharpening the axe upon the whetstone. And in five cities did they set up anvils to make arms thereon, headpieces and shields of wicker, and breastplates of bronze, and greaves of silver. Nor did men regard any more the reaping hook or the plough making new for battle the swords of their fathers. Now the greatest of the chiefs were these. First, Prince Mezentius, the Tuscan, who regarded not the gods, and with him Lossus, his son, than whom was none fairer in the host but Turnus only. A thousand men followed him from Agila. Worthy was he of a better father. Next came, with horses that none might surpass, Aventinus, son of Hercules, and on his shield was the emblem of his father, the Hydra, with its hundred snakes. Long swords had his men and Sabine spears, and he himself had about his head and shoulders a great lion's skin, with terrible mane and great white teeth. And from Tiber came two youths of Argos, twin brothers, Catullus and Chorus, swift and strong as two centaurs from the hills, and Siculus, who builded Prinesti, was there, son of Vulcan, and a great company of country folk with him, whereof many bear not shield nor spear, but slings with bullets of lead, and javelins in either hand, and helmets of wolf's skin upon their heads. After him marched Messippus, tamer of horses, Neptune's son, whom no man might lay low with fire or sword. And the people followed, singing a war-song of their king, like to a great flock of swans, which flies with many cries across the Asian marsh. And next, Clausus the Sabine, from whom is sprung the great Claudian house, and Halesis, companion of Agamemnon, and enemy of Troy from of old, with many nations behind him. Clubs had they, fastened with thongs of leather, and wicker shields on their left arms, and their swords were shaped as reaping hooks. After these came Ebolus, son of Telon, with the men of Campania, wearing helmets of cork, and having shields and swords of bronze, also Euphens, of Nursi, with his robber bands, and Umbro, the Marcian priest, a mighty wizard and charmer of serpents, 
who also could heal their bite. But the wound of the Trojan spears he could not heal, nor did all his charms and mighty herbs avail him. With them also came Verbius, son of Hippolytus, from Egeria. For men say that Hippolytus, when the curse of his father had fallen upon him, and he had perished by the madness of his horses, was made alive by the skill of Esolapius, and that Jupiter, being wroth that a mortal should return from the dead, slew the healer, the son of Phoebus, with his thunderbolt. But that Hippolytus Diana hid in the grove of Aresia, that he might spend the rest of his days obscure without offence, and therefore do they yet hinder horses from coming near to the temple of Diana. Nevertheless, the youth Verbius drave horses in his chariot. But chief among them all was Turnus, who moved in the midst, clad in armour, and overtopping them all by his head, and he had a helmet with three crests, and the chimera thereon for a sign. And on his shield was Io, with her horns lifted to heaven, and Argus the herdsman, and Inachus pouring a river from his urn. A great multitude of footmen followed him, Vertulians, and Sicanians, and they that dwell about the Tiber, and about Anxer, and about the green woods of Feronia. Last of all came Camilla the Volsian, with a great company on horses, clad in armour of bronze. She loved neither distaff nor the basket of Minerva, but rather to fight and to outstrip the winds in running. And a mighty runner was she, for she would run over the harvest-field, nor harm the corn, and when she sped across the waves of the sea, she wetted not her foot therein. All the youth marvelled to behold her, and the women stood gazing upon her as she went. For a robe of royal purple was about her shoulders, and a snood of gold about her hair, and she carried a Syrian quiver, and a pike of myrtle-wood, as the shepherds are wont. CHAPTER Eighteen, KING OF Vander. So the chiefs were gathered together, and much people with them, Mezentius, and Euphens, and Mesippus, being their leaders. They sent an embassy likewise to Diomed, for Diomed had built him a city in Italy, even Arpi, to tell him that Aeneas and the men of Troy were setting up a kingdom in these parts, and to bid him take counsel for himself. But Aeneas was much troubled at these things, and cast about in his mind where he should look for help. And while he meditated thereon he slept, and lo, in his dreams, the god of the river, even Father Tiber, appeared to him. An old man was he, and clad in a blue linen robe, and having a crown of reeds upon his head. And he spake, saying, Thou art welcome to this land, to which thou hast brought the gods of Troy. Be not dismayed at wars and rumours of wars, nor cease from thy enterprise, and this shall be a sign unto thee. Thou shalt find upon the shore a white sow with thirty young, white also, about her teats, and it shall come to pass that after thirty years Iulus shall build him a white city. And now I will tell thee how thou shalt have victory in this war. Certain men of Arcadia, following their king, Evander, have built a city in this land, and called its name Palantium. These wage war continually with the Latins. To them therefore thou must go, making thy way up the stream of the river. Rise therefore, and offer sacrifice to Juno, appeasing her wrath, and to me thou shalt perform thy vows when thou shalt have prevailed. For know that I am Tiber the river, and that of all the rivers on earth none is dearer to the gods. Then Aeneas roused him from sleep, and made his supplications to the nymphs and the river-god, that they would be favourable to him. And when he looked, lo, upon the shore a white sow with thirty young, white also, about her teats. Of these he made a sacrifice to Juno, and after this he commanded that they should make ready two ships, and so went on his way. And Tiber stayed his stream so that the men might not toil in rowing. Quickly they sped and many trees were above their heads, and the image thereof in the water beneath, and at noonday they beheld a city with walls, and a citadel, and a few houses round about. Now it chanced that Evander and his people were holding a sacrifice that day to Hercules before the city. But when they saw through the trees the ships approaching, 
They were astonished, and rose all from the feast. But Pallas, who was the son of the king, commanded that they should not interrupt the sacrifice, and snatching a spear, he cried from the mound whereon the altar stood, Strangers, why come ye? What seek ye? Do ye bring peace or war? Then Aeneas cried from the stern of his ship, holding out the while an olive branch, We be men of Troy, enemies of the Latins, and we seek King Evander. Say therefore to him that Aeneas, prince of Troy, is come, seeking alliance with him. Much did Pallas marvel to hear this name, and said, Approach thou, whoever thou art, and hold converse with my father. And he caught him by the hand. And when Aeneas was set before King Evander, he spoke, saying, I come to thee, O king, not unwilling or fearful, though indeed thou art a Greek and akin to the sons of Atreus. For between thee and me also there is kindred, for Dardanus, builder of Troy, was the son of Electra, who was the daughter of Atlas. And ye come from Mercurius, who was the son of Selene, who was also the daughter of Atlas. Wherefore I sent not ambassadors to thee, but came myself, fearing nothing. Know thou that the Daunian race, which warreth against thee, pursueth us also, against whom if they prevail, without doubt they shall rule over Italy, from the one sea even to the other. I would therefore that we make alliance together. And as he spake, Evander ceased not to regard him, and when he had ended spake, saying, Welcome, great son of Troy! Gladly do I recognize the voice and face of Anchises, for I remember how Priam came of old time to the kingdom of his sister Hesione, who was the wife of Telamon, and many princes were with him, but the mightiest of them was Anchises. Much did I love the man, and took him with me to Phineas, and he gave me when he departed a quiver and arrows of Lycia, and a cloak with threads of gold, and two bridles of gold, which my son Pallas hath to this day. The alliance that thou seekest I grant. To-morrow shalt thou depart with such help as I can give. But now, since ye come at such a good time, join us in our sacrifice and feast. So they feasted together on the flesh of oxen, and drank wine, and were merry. But when they had made an end of eating and drinking, King Evander spake, saying, This great feast, my friend, we hold not without good reason, which thou shalt now hear from me. Seest thou this great ruin of rocks? Here in old time was a cave, running very deep into the cliff, wherein Sacus dwelt, a monster but half man, whose father was Vulcan. The ground thereof reeked with blood, and at the mouth were fixed the heads of dead men. Very great of stature was he, and breathed out fire from his mouth. To this land came Hercules, driving before him the oxen of Gerion, whom he had slain. And when he had left these to feed in the valley by the river, Sacus, that he might fill up the measure of his wickedness, stole four bulls and four heifers, the very chiefest of the herd. And that he might conceal the thing, he dragged them by the tails backwards, so that the tracks led not to the cave. But it chanced that the herd made a great bellowing when Hercules would have driven them away in the morning, and one of the heifers, which Sacus had hidden in the cave, bellowed also, making answer. Then was Hercules very wroth, and caught up in his hand his great knotted club, and climbed to the top of the hill. Then was Sacus sore afraid, and fled to his cave swift as the wind, fear giving wings to his feet. And when he was come thither, he shut himself therein, letting fall a great stone which he had caused to hang over the mouth thereof, by cunning devices that he had learned from his father. And when Hercules was come he sought to find entrance and could not. But at the last he saw one of the rocks, that it was very high, and leaned to the river. This he pushed from the other side, so that it fell with a great crash into the water. Then did the whole cave of Sacus lie open to view, horrible to behold, as though the earth were to open her mouth and show the regions of the dead. And first Hercules shot at the monster with arrows, and cast boughs and great stones at him. And Sacus vomited forth from his mouth fire and smoke filling the whole cave, and Hercules endured not to be so baffled, but plunged into the cave even where the smoke was thickest, and caught him, twining his arms and legs about him, and strangled him that he died. 
of which deed, O oh my friends, we keep the remembrance year by year. Do ye therefore join in our feast, putting first wreaths of poplar about your heads, for the poplar is the tree of Hercules. So they feasted, and the priests, even the Salii, being in two companies, young and old, sang the great deeds of Hercules, how, being yet an infant, he strangled the snakes that Juno sent to slay him, and overthrew mighty cities, and endured many grievous labors, slaying the centaurs and the lion of Nemea, and how he went down to hell, and dragged the dog Cerberus therefrom, and many other things likewise. And at even they went back to the city, and as they went Evander told Aeneas many things concerning the country, how of old a savage race dwelt therein, living even as the beasts whom Saturn, flying from his son Jupiter, first taught, giving them customs and laws, and how other kings also had borne rule over them, and how he himself had come to the land at the bidding of Apollo. Also he showed him the city which he had founded, and the places thereof. Very famous were they in after-time, when mighty Rome was builded, even on the selfsame ground. And when they came to his palace, he said, Hercules entered this dwelling, though indeed it be small and lowly. Think not, then, overmuch of riches, and so make thyself worthy to ascend to heaven, as he also ascended. Then he led him within the palace, and bade him rest on a couch, whereon was spread the skin of an African bear. End of chapters 17 and 18 Chapters 19 and 20 Of Stories from Virgil Chapters 19 and 20 Chapter 19 The Arms of Aeneas Very early the next morning the old man Evander rose up from his bed and donned his tunic, and bound his Tuscan sandals on his feet, and girt his Tegean sword to his side, flinging a panther's hide over his left shoulder. Pallas his son also went with him, and two hounds which lay by his chamber followed him, for he would fain have speech with Aeneas, whom indeed he found astir, and Achates with him. Then spake Evander, Great chief of Troy, good will have we, but scanty means, for our folk are few and our bounds narrow. But I will tell thee of a great people and a wealthy, with whom thou mayest make alliance. Nigh to this place is the famous city Agilla, which the men of Lydia, settling in this land of Etruria, builded aforetime. Now of this Agilla Mezentius was king, who surpassed all men in wickedness, for he would join a living man to a dead corpse, and so leave him to perish miserably. But after a while the citizens rebelled, saying that he should not reign over them, and slew his guards and burnt his palace. But on him they laid not hands, for he fled to Prince Turnus. Therefore there is war between Turnus and Agilla. Now in this war thou shalt be leader, for as yet, when they would have gone forth to battle, the soothsayers have hindered them, saying, Though your wrath against Mezentius be just, yet must no man of Italy lead this people. But look you for a stranger. And they would fain have had me for their leader, but I am old and feeble, and my son Pallas also is akin to them, seeing that he was born of a Sabine mother. But thou art in thy prime, and altogether a stranger in race. Wherefore take this office upon thyself, Pallas also shall go with thee, and learn from thee to bear himself as a warrior. Also I will send with thee two hundred chosen horsemen, and Pallas will give thee as many. And even before he had made an end of speaking, Venus gave them a sign, even thunder in a clear sky, and there was heard a voice as of a Tuscan trumpet, and when they looked to the heavens, lo, there was a flashing of arms. And Aeneas knew the sign and the interpretation thereof, even that he should prosper in that to which he set his hand. Therefore he bade Evander be of good cheer. Then again they did sacrifice, and afterwards Aeneas returned to his companions, of whom he chose some, and them the bravest, who should go with him to Agilla, and the rest he bade return to Iulus to the camp. But when he was now ready to depart, Evander took him by the hand, saying, O oh, that Jupiter would give me back the years that are gone, when I slew under Prinesti, King Erulus, to whom at his birth his mother Feronia gave three lives. Thrice must he needs be slain, and thrice I slew him, 
Then had I not been parted from thee, my son, nor had the wicked Mazentius slain so many of my people. And now may the gods hear my prayer. If it be their pleasure that Pallas should come back, may I live to see it. But if not, may I die even now while I hold thee in my arms, my son, my one and only joy. And his spirit left the old man, and they carried him into the palace. Then the horsemen rode out from the gates with Pallas in the midst, adorned with mantle and blazoned arms, fair as the morning star, which Venus loves beyond all others in the sky. The women stood watching them from the walls while they shouted aloud and galloped across the plain, and after a while they came to a grove, near to which the Etruscans and Tarchon, their leader, had pitched their camp. Now in the meantime Venus had bestirred herself for her son, for while he slept in the palace of Evander, she spake to her husband, even Vulcan, saying, While the Greeks were fighting against Troy, I sought not thy help, for I would not that thou shouldst labor in vain. But now that Aeneas is come to Italy by the command of the gods, I ask thee that thou shouldst make arms and armor for my son. This Aurora asked for Memnon, this Thetis for Achilles, and thou grantest it to them, and now thou seest how the nations join themselves to destroy him. Wherefore I pray thee to help me. And he hearkened to her voice. Therefore, when the morning was come, very early, even as a woman who maketh her living by the distaff riseth and kindleth her fire, and giveth tasks to her maidens, that she may provide for her husband and her children, even so Vulcan rose betimes to his work. Now there is an island, Lepare, nigh unto the shore of Sicily, and there the god had set up his furnace and anvil, and the cyclopes were at work, forging thunderbolts for Jupiter, whereof one remained half wrought. Three parts of hail had they used, and three of rain-cloud, and three of red fire and south wind, and now they were adding to it lightning, and noise, and fear, and wrath, with avenging flames and elsewhere they wrought a chariot for Mars, and a shirt of mail for Minerva, even the Aegis, with golden scales as of a serpent. And in the midst the gorgon's head, lopped at the nape, with rolling eyes. But the god cried, Cease ye your toils, ye must make arms for a hero. Then they all bent them to their toil. Then bronze and gold and iron flowed in streams and some plied the bellows, and others dipped the hissing mass in water, and a third turned the oar in griping pincers. A helmet they made with nodding crest, that blazed like fire, and a sword, and a cuirass of ruddy bronze, and greaves of gold molten many times, and a spear, and a shield whereon was wrought a marvellous story of things to come. For the god had set forth all the story of Rome, there lay the she-wolf in the cave of Mars, suckling the twin babes that feared her not. And she, bending back her neck, licked them with her tongue. And there the men of Rome carried off the Sabine virgins to be their wives, and hard by the battle raged. And there, again, the kings made peace together, with offerings and sacrifice. Also there were wrought the chariots that tore asunder Metis of Alba for his treachery, and Porsena bidding the Romans take back their king, besieging the city, but the men of Rome stood in arms against him. Angry and threatening stood the king to see how Cocles broke down the bridge, and Clolia burst her bonds to swim across the river. There Manlius stood to guard the capital, and a goose of silver flapped his wings in arcades of gold, and showed the Gauls at hand. And they, under cover of the darkness, were climbing through the thickets, even to the ridge of the hill. Their hair was wrought in gold, in gold their raiment, and their cloaks were of diverse colors crossed, milk-white their necks and clasped with gold. Two spears had each and an oblong shield. Likewise he wrought the dwellings of the dead, of the just and of the unjust. Here Catalini hung from the rock while the Furies pursued him. There Cato gave the people laws and all about was the sea wrought in gold, but the waves were blue, and white the foam, and therein sported dolphins of silver. But in the midst was wrought a great battle of ships at the Cape of Actium. On the one side Augustus led the men of Italy to battle, standing very high on the stern of the ship. From either temple of his head blazed forth a fire, 
and Agrippa also led on his array with a naval crown about his head, and on the other side stood Antony, having with him barbarous soldiers arrayed in diverse fashions, and leading to battle Egypt and Persia and the armies of the East, and lo, behind him, a shameful sight, his Egyptian wife. But in another part the battle raged, and all the sea was in a foam with oars and triple beaks. It seemed as though islands were torn from their places, or mountain clashed against mountain. So great was the shock of the ships, and all about flew javelins with burning tow, and the sea was red with blood. In the midst stood Queen Cleopatra, with a timbrel in her hand, and called her armies to the battle. Behind her you might see the snakes by whose bite she should die, and on one side the dog Anubis, with other monstrous shapes of gods, and over against them Neptune and Venus and Minerva. And in the midst Mars was seen to rage, embossed in steel, and the Furies hovered above. And discord stalked with garment rent, while high above Apollo stretched his bow, and Egyptian and Indian and Arab fled before him. And in a third place great Caesar rode through Rome in triumph, and the city was full of joy and the matrons were gathered in the temples, and through the street there passed a long array of nations that he had conquered, from the east, and from the west, and from the north, and from the south. Such was the shield which Vulcan wrought. And Venus, when she saw her son that none was with him, for he had wandered apart from his companions, brought the arms and laid them down before him, saying, See the arms that I promised I would give thee. These my husband, the fire-god, hath wrought for thee. With these thou needst shun no enemy, no, not Turnus himself. Right glad was he to see them, and fitted them upon him, and swung the shield upon his shoulder, nor knew what mighty fates his children he bare thereon. CHAPTER Twenty, Nisus and Euryalus but Juno, ever seeking occasion against the men of Troy, sent Iris, the messenger of the gods, to Turnus. As he sat in the grove of Palumnus, his father, Iris said, That which none of the gods had dared to promise thee, lo, time itself hath brought. Aeneas hath left his companions and his ship, seeking the city of Evander, yea, and the Tuscans also. Do thou therefore take the occasion, and surprise the camp while he is yet absent. And she spread her wings and mounted to heaven by the arch of the rainbow. And Turnus cried, I know thee, goddess, and follow thy sign. And having first washed his hands, he prayed and vowed his vows to the gods. So the army went forth to the battle. Messippus led the first line, and the sons of Tyrius the rear. And in the midst was Turnus. And the men of Troy saw a great cloud of dust upon the plain. And Sacus cried from the walls, what meaneth this cloud that I see? Two arms, my friends, climb the walls, the enemy is at hand. Then did the men of Troy shut the gates and man the walls, for so had Aeneas commanded them, saying, Fight not whatever befall in battle, nor trust yourselves to the plain, but defend your walls. Therefore they shut their gates, and waited till the enemy should come near. And Turnus, on a horse of Thrace, rode first, and twenty youths with him, and he cried, Is there a man who will first venture the attack? And he threw his javelin, making a beginning of battle, and his companions shouted aloud. Much they marveled that the men of Troy kept them within the walls and came not forth to the battle. And Turnus ever regarded the walls, how he might enter therein, even as a wolf prowleth round the fold at midnight, while the lambs within bleat, being safe by their mothers. But he rageth without to hear them being mad with wrath and hunger, and his tongue is a thirst for blood, even so did Turnus rage round the camp, and cast about how he might draw forth the men of Troy into the plain. And at the last he bethought him of the ships, which lay at the camp's side, and called for torches of pine, and the people followed him with a shout, and the smoke rose up to the heavens. Then did a marvellous thing befall. Now in the days when Aeneas was building his ships upon Mount Ida, Sibylle, mother of the gods, spake to Jupiter, saying, Grant, my son, that these ships, which Aeneas buildeth of my pine-trees, for these have I given to him freely, may be safe from winds and waves. But Jupiter answered, 
What is this that thou askest, my mother? Wouldst thou have immortality for mortal ships? Not so. But this I grant, that whichsoever of these shall come safe to the land of Italy shall become nymphs of the sea. And now the day was come. Wherefore there was heard an awful voice, saying, Fear not, men of Troy, nor care to defend your ships. And to the ships, go, henceforth ye are nymphs of the sea. And lo, straightway the cables break, and where the ships had been were the shapes of women, for each ship a woman. Much did the Latins wonder to behold the thing, and Tiber stayed his stream to see it. But Turnus trembled not, crying, This marvel meaneth evil for the men of Troy, their ships abide not our attack, nor have they any longer that wherewith they may flee from us. And as for fate, I heed it not. It was the fate of the men of Troy that they should touch the land of Italy. It is my fate that I should destroy the accursed race. They rob me of my wife. That wrong toucheth others besides Menelaus. Surely it had been enough to perish once. But why, then, will they sin again? It had been well that they loathed thereafter all womankind. Or do they think that this rampart shall protect them? Did they not see the walls which Neptune builded settle down in the fire? And now who cometh with me to storm their camp? I need not arms from Vulcan's forge, or a thousand ships. Deeds of darkness and of stealth they need not fear. We will not hide us in a horse of wood. In daylight will we burn their walls. For surely the youth of Italy is not as the youth of Greece, whom Hector kept at bay for ten years. Then he commanded that they should lay siege to the camp. And Messapus he set to watch the gate, and fourteen Rutulian chiefs, with each a hundred youths, kept guard on the walls. So all the night they watched, and feasted, and drank, and made merry. But the men of Troy labored meanwhile, making strong the gates and the towers of the walls, and Menestheus and Sergestus were instant with command and exhortation, for Aeneas had appointed them to this thing, should any need arise, he being absent. Now the keeper of the gate was Nisus, a valiant man of war, and with him Euryalus, the goodliest youth among the men of Troy. And great love was between them, and as they watched, Nisus said, Whether it be a bidding of the gods, or prompting of my own heart, I know not. But I have a great desire to do somewhat this night. Seest thou how the enemy lie asleep and drunken? Can I not win some honour hence, and carry the tidings of these things to Aeneas? For yonder by the hill lieth the way to the city of Evander. Then Euryalus made answer, Nay, but thou goest not alone, Nisus, nor leavest me. My father, Opheltes, trained me not to such baseness, nor have I so borne myself in thy company, and truly I should count life well lost for such honour. Then said Nisus, I thought not so ill of thee. So may Jupiter bring me back in safety and honour. Yet should some mischance befall, I would that thou shouldst live to buy my body back, or if that may not be, to pay due honour to my spirit. Think too of thy mother, who, alone of all the mothers of Troy, hath for love of thee come to this land of Italy. But Euryalus said, Thou makest idle excuses, for I am steadfastly purposed to go. Let us hasten, therefore. So they woke those who should take their places at the gate and sought speech of the chiefs. These indeed were holding counsel, and stood leaning on their spears in the midst of the camp. And Nisus said that he had somewhat to say, and that the matter pressed. Then Iulus bade him speak, and he made answer, The enemy lie sleeping and drunken about the walls, and the fires are extinguished. If fortune favour us we will win a way to Aeneas, to the city of Evander, and slay many, and take much spoil likewise. The way indeed we know, having learnt it while we hunted in these parts. Then the old man Aletes said, Surely Troy hath not altogether perished, having yet such hearts as yours. And he threw his arms about them, weeping, and Iulus said, Bring back my father, and all shall be well, and I will give you two cups of silver embossed with figures of men which my father took from the city of Arisba. And if we subdue this land of Italy, thou, Nisus, shall have the horses and the arms of Turnus, and twelve women captives likewise, and twelve men with their arms, and the domain of King Latinus. 
and thou, Euryalus, who art nearer of age to me, shalt be next to myself in all things. Then Euryalus made answer, One thing I ask thee more. I have a mother, of the lineage of Priam. To her I say not farewell, not being able to endure her tears. Do thou care for her, if she be bereaved of me. And Iulus said, She shall be as my mother to me. Then he gave him his own sword, with its scabbard of ivory, and Menestheus gave to Nisus a lion's skin, and Aletes a helmet, and all went with them to the gates, with many prayers and vows. Also Iulus, being wise beyond his years, sent many messages to his father. Then they crossed the moat, and came upon the enemy as they slept, Nisus being before, and Euryalus keeping watch, lest any should assail them from behind. And first Nisus slew Ramnes, as he slept, an augur he was, whom Turnus most trusted, yet he knew not his own doom. Next he slew the three servants, and the armor-bearer, and the charioteer of Remus, and after Remus himself cutting off his head. Others also he slew, and among them Serenus, a fair youth, who had been foremost in his sport that night. It had been well for him had he prolonged it even unto dawn. Many also did Euryalus slay, all of them in their sleep, save Rhetus only, who being awake would fain have hidden himself behind a great jar, but could not. But when he would have assailed Messippus and his comrades, Nisus, seeing that he was mastered by the love of slaughter, cried aloud, Cease! The day approacheth. It is enough that we have made us a way through the enemy. Much spoil did they leave behind them. But Euryalus took a sword-belt with knobs of gold from Romnes. Cedicus gave it to Remulus of Tiber, and he to his grandson, from whom Romnes had won it in war, and put on his head the helmet of Messippus, so they departed from the camp. But it so chanced that three hundred horsemen, with Volsens their leader, were riding to the camp from the city, and as they came nigh one of them espied in the light of the moon the helmet which Euryalus, being but a youth and unwary, had put on him. And Volsens cried, Who are ye? Whither do ye go? But they answered nothing, making haste to fly. Then Volsens commanded that they should keep the wood on every side. Very thick it was with dark ilex trees and brambles. And Euryalus, indeed, being laden with his spoil and fearful, wandered from the way, but Nisus got himself clear. But when he came to the stalls where they kept the cattle of King Latinus, he knew himself to be alone, and looked round for his companion, but saw him not. Then returning, he searched through the wood, till he heard the sound of horsemen approaching, and lo, Euryalus was in the midst, seeking to get free, but could not. Forthwith, having first prayed to Diana that she would help him, if perchance he might scatter this company, he cast his spear. It pierced the back of Sulmo, and passed even through his heart, and while they all looked, lo, another spear, and it pierced the head of Tagus from temple to temple. Very wroth was Volsens to see such slaughter, and know not how it befell. And he cried, Thou at least shalt suffer for these deeds, and flew upon Euryalus. This could not Nisus endure to see, but rushed from his hiding-place, and cried, Lo! I am the man who wrought this slaughter. Turn your swords against me. He did not, nay, he could not do such deeds. He did but follow his friend. But not the less did the sword of Volsens pierce the side of Euryalus, and the blood gushed out over his fair body, and his head drooped, even as a flower which the ploughshare cuts in the field, or a poppy whose stalk is broken. Then rushed Nisus into the midst, thinking only how he might slay Volsens nor could the enemy slay him, but that he thrust his sword into his mouth, and slew him, and afterwards, being pierced with many wounds, he fell dead upon the body of his friend. But when the horsemen were come to the camp, they found the slaughter that had been done, and when the day dawned, they set the battle in array against the men of Troy, and the heads of Nisus and Euryalus they fixed upon poles, and showed them. But when the report of these things came to the ears of the mother of Euryalus, she threw down her distaff, and hasted through the camp, and coming to the wall she cried, Is it thus I see thee, my son? Why was it not granted to me to bid thee farewell? 
and now I may not close thine eyes or wrap thee in the garments which I have made, solacing my cares with the labours of the loom. Slay me with your spears, ye Latins, or thou, great Jupiter, smite me with thy thunder, since I may not rid me otherwise of this hateful life. But when with her wailing she touched the hearts of the men so that they forgot their valour, Ilionius and Iulus commanded Ideas and Actor that they should lay hands upon her and carry her to her dwelling. End of chapters 19 and 20 Chapters 21 and 22 of Stories from Virgil Chapters 21 and 22 Chapter 21 The Battle at the Camp And now the trumpet gave the signal for battle. First the Volscians drew near to the wall. These held their shields over their heads, joining them in close array, so that they were like unto the shell of a tortoise. And they that bare them filled the moat and pulled down the wall. And some would have mounted the walls on ladders, while the men of Troy cast spears at them and thrust at them with poles, being indeed well used to the manner of such a fight from walls. But on the covering of shields they threw down a huge block, breaking it through and scattering the men, who would not indeed fight any more in such fashion, but cast all manner of javelins and the like against the men of Troy. And Mezentius, the Tuscan, came on, shaking a lighted torch of pine in his hand, and Messapus tore down the rampart and called for a scaling ladder that he might mount up into the breach. Now there was a tower upon the wall which the Italians sought to take, and the men of Troy to defend it cast stones and darts through the loopholes thereof. On to this Turnus cast a torch, setting fire to the wall, and the flame, the wind fanning it, climbed from story to story, and when they that were therein fled to the part that was yet unconsumed, lo, the whole tower fell forward, and all perished, two only escaping, Helenor and Lycus. And Helenor was the elder, and when he saw that the enemy was about him on every side, then, even as a beast which the hunters compass about with a great ring waxeth desperate and flingeth himself over the nets upon their spears, so he threw himself on the ranks of the Latins, where the spears were thickest, and so died. But Lycus was very swift of foot, and won even as far as the wall, and would fain have climbed thereon. But Turnus caught him, crying, Thinkest thou to escape me? And he laid hands upon him as he hung from the wall, dragging down much wall likewise, even as an eagle seizes a swan or a wolf a lamb. So he seized him. Then did the battle wax fiercer and fiercer, and many fell on this side and on that, for Ilionius smote Lucidius when he would have set fire to the gates, and Capus slew Privernus, and Mezentius, having cast away his spear, smote the son of Arsens with a bullet of lead from his sling. And now Iulus, having used his bow aforetime on beasts of the field only, now first drew it against a man, even against Numinus who had to wife the sister of Turnus. For this Numinus, thinking himself to be some great one, stood in the front rank, and defied the men of Troy, saying, Are ye not ashamed, ye that have already been twice conquered, now to be besieged again? What madness brought you to Italy? We are a hardy race, for our new-born babes are dipped in the stream, and our boys are hunters in the woods. And when we be men, our hands are ever on the ploughshare or the sword, yea, and old age subdues us not. For when our hair is white, yet do we cover it with the helmet. But ye with your mantles of purple and saffron, and sleeved tunics, and ribboned mitres, lovers of sleep and of the dance, ye men, nay, rather ye women of Phrygia, what do ye hear? But the young Iulus endured not to hear such boasting. He fixed an arrow in his bow, and drew the string, which was of horsehair. And ere he let fly, he cried to Jupiter, Help me now, great father, so will I bring year by year to thy temple a steer with gilded horns. And Jupiter heard, and thundered on the left hand, and now, together with the thunder, clanged the bowstring, sending death, and the arrow hissed in the air and smote Numinous through the head, even from temple to temple. This is the answer that the twice-conquered men of Troy send thee. So cried the young Iulus, 
and all the people shouted for joy, and Apollo, where he sat in heaven and regarded the battle, spake, Go thou on, as thou beginnest, child and father of gods. Tis thus that the race of Troy shall hereafter bring all wars to an end. Then he came down from heaven into the camp of Troy, and took upon himself the shape of the old man Butus. He had been aforetime the armor-bearer of Anchises, and now followed Iulus. And the god spake, saying, It is enough that thou hast slain the boaster Numinous. The archer Apollo envieth thee not this glory, but tempt the battle no more. So saying, he vanished out of their sight. But the chiefs knew him who he was, yea, and heard the rattle of his quiver as he departed, and they suffered not Iulus to draw his bow again. But all the more the battle raged along the walls. Now there were two youths, sons of Alcanor of Mount Ida, tall as pine trees, and their names were Pandarus and Bitius. These having charge of the gate opened it, and, standing on the right hand and on the left even as towers, bade the enemy enter. And many of these, seeing the open gate, rushed forward, but fell slain upon the threshold. And now the men of Troy took heart, and pressed on beyond the walls. But when Turnus heard tidings of these things, he made haste to the gate, and first he slew Antiphates, who was a son of Sarpedon, and others also, and Bitius himself with them. Not with a javelin did he slay him, no javelin had done such deed, but with a great spear of Saguntum, having a point of a cubit's length. Through two bull's hides it passed, and two folds of his coat of mail. With a great crash he fell, and his shield upon him even as falls a great pile which men set up in the bay of Bailly. So Bitius fell, and Pandarus his brother, seeing that things fared ill with the men of Troy, shut to the gate, thrusting it into its place with his broad shoulders. Many of his companions he left without, among their enemies, and many he shut in. But being blind with haste and fear, he saw not that he shut in among them Prince Turnus himself. But Turnus raged for blood as a tiger rageth among herds of cattle, and the men of Troy fled before him. But Pandarus feared not to meet him, hoping also that he should have vengeance for his brother. And he cried, This is not thy city of Ardea, but the camp of thy enemies. Hence thou goest not forth. But Turnus made answer, Begin, if thou hast any valour in thy heart. Thou shalt find another Achilles here. Then Pandarus cast a great spear with a knotted staff, whereon the bark was left, but Juno turned it aside so that it fixed itself in the gate, and Turnus said, My weapon thou escapest not thus, nor maketh my hand such error. And he lifted his sword, rising to the blow, and cleft the man's head, so that it fell divided upon his shoulders. Then, indeed, if only Turnus had bethought him to open the gate that the Latins should come in. There had come an end that day to the war and to the whole nation of Troy. But he thought not of it, caring only to slay the enemy. Many did he smite, some on the back as they fled, and some in front. Among them Amicus the hunter, and Clytius the singer, whom the Muses loved. But now the chiefs of Troy, Menestheus and Sergestus, began to gather the people together, and to make head against Turnus. And Menestheus cried, Whither will ye flee? Have ye any walls beside? Shall one man work such slaughter in the city? Have you no thought, ye cowards, for your king? Then the men of Troy took heart again, and joined themselves in close array, so that Turnus could not but give way before them. Just so a lion is driven back by a crowd of men. Frightened is he, yet fierce withal, and his courage suffereth him not to flee, yet so many are against him, he dareth not to stand. Even thus did Turnus give way. Twice he turned and put the men of Troy to flight, and twice they mastered him. For the helmet on his head rang with the javelins, and was broken with stones, and the crest was stricken off, and the shield was shattered with blows, and the sweat poured off from him, and scarce could he breathe, till at the last, having now come to the river, he plunged therein, and so returned to his companions. And still the battle grew fiercer and fiercer about the walls, and the ring of them that defended the camp grew thinner and thinner. There stood Asius, the son of Embrasus, and Clarus, 
and Themon, brothers of Sarpedon the Lycian, and Acmon, the brother of Menestheus, and others with them. And in the midst stood the young Iulus, with his comely head uncovered, like to a jewel that is set in gold or ivory, or that is compassed about with boxwood or terebinth. CHAPTER Twenty Two: THE BATTLE ON THE SHORE In the meanwhile Aeneas had made alliance with Tarchon and the Tuscans, for when he had expounded all things to Tarchon their chief, telling him with all whence he had come, the people, believing that all things were now fulfilled as the gods would have them, followed him willingly. Now, therefore, he was returning to the camp, leading the way in his ship, on the prow whereof were two lions, and above them the image of the goddess Ida. Pallas also sat beside him, and asked him now concerning the stars by which men guide their ways at night, and now concerning the things which he had himself endured by land and sea. After him came Massicus in the tiger, with whom were a thousand men from Clusium and Cosi, and Abbas with six hundred from Populonia, and from Ilva rich in mines three hundred more. Asilus also, the soothsayer, came leading a thousand men from Pisa, and Aster, the fairest of men, with three hundred from Siri, and from the cornfields of Minio, and from Pyrgi. Also the Ligurians came, with Cinerus, son of Sickness, who had for his crest swan feathers, and his ship was called the Centaur, and Ochnus came from Mantua in the Mincius, and five hundred with him, and Aulestes in the Triton and the number of the ships was thirty in all. And now the night had fallen, and as Aeneas sat at the helm, for care suffered him not to sleep, lo, there appeared to him a troop of nymphs, which once had been his ships, and one of these, by name Simodosia, came behind and caught the stern of the ship with her right hand, swimming meanwhile with the left. Then she spake, saying, Wakest thou, son of the goddess? We are pines of Mount Ida, once thy ships but now changed to nymphs, when Turnus would have burned us with fire. Know that thy son is besieged in the camp. Arm thyself, therefore, with the arms which Vulcan hath wrought for thee. To-morrow thou shalt lay many Latins low in death. And as she spake she pushed the ship with her hand, and it sped along through the waters, and the rest also with it. And when the day was come, Aeneas commanded that all should make them ready for battle and now the camp was in his sight, as he stood on the stern and lifted in his left hand a flashing shield. Much did the men of Troy rejoice to see that sight, and shouted amain, and Turnus and his companions marvelled, till they looked behind them, and, lo, the sea was covered with ships, and in the midst was Aeneas. And it was as if a flame poured forth from his helmet and his shield, bright as is a comet, when it shines in the night-time red as blood or as the dog-star in the hot summer-tide, with baleful light bringing fevers to the race of men. Yet did not Turnus lose heart, but would occupy the shore, and hinder from landing those that came. Wherefore he cried, Now have ye that which ye wished for. Lo, the enemy hides not himself behind a wall, but meets us face to face. Remember wife and child and home and the great deeds of your fathers. Let us meet them on the shore, ere yet their footing is firm and he thought within himself who should watch the walls, and who should meet the enemy when he would gain the shore. But in the meanwhile Aeneas landed his men on gangways from the ships, and some leapt on shore, having watched for the ebb of the waves, and some ran along the oars. Tarchon also, the Etrurian, having spied a place where the sea broke not in waves, commanded his men that they should beach the ships, which indeed they did without harm. Only the ship of Tarchon himself was caught upon a ridge, and the men thrown therefrom. Yet these also, after a while, got safe to the shore. Then did Aeneas do great deeds against the enemy. For first he slew Theron, who surpassed all men in stature, smiting through his coat of mail, and Sisius, and Gaius, who wielded clubs after the manner of Hercules. Sons were they of Melampus, who had borne Hercules' company in all his labours. Then the sons of Phorcus came against him, seven in number, and they cast at him seven spears, whereof some rebounded from his shield, and some grazed his body, but harmed him not. Then cried Aeneas to Achates, Give me spears enough, 
spears which have slain the greeks on the fields of troy shall not be cast in vain against these latins then of the seven he slew meon and elcanor for the spear pierced the breastplate and heart of meon and when elcanor would have held him up passed through his arm and yet kept on its way and many others fell on this side and on that for they fought with equal fortune on the very threshold of italy they fought and neither would the Italians give place, nor yet the men of Troy, for foot was planted close to foot, and man stood fast by man. In another part of the battle Pallas fought with his Arcadians, and when he saw that they fled, not being wont to fight on foot, for by reason of the ground they had sent away their horses, he cried, Now by the name of your king Evander, and by my hope that I may win praise like unto his, I beseech you that ye trust not to your feet, ye must make your way through the enemy with your swords. Where the crowd is the thickest, follow me. Nor have ye now gods against you. These are but mortal men, ye see. And he rushed into the midst of the enemy. First he smote Lagos with his spear, even as he was lifting a great stone from the earth. In the back he smote him, and having smitten him, strove to draw forth the spear, and while he strove, his bow would have slain him, but Pallas was aware of his coming, and pierced him in the breast with his sword. Next he slew the twin brothers, Larides and Thimber. Very like they were, and it pleased father and mother that they knew not the one from the other. But Pallas made a cruel difference between them, for from Thimber he struck off the head, and from Larides the right hand, and after these he slew Rhetus, as he fled past him in his chariot. And now even as a shepherd sets fire to a wood, and the flames are borne along by the wind, so Pallas, and his Arcadians following, raged through the battle. And when Halesus, the companion of Agamemnon, would have stayed them, Pallas, first praying to father Tiber, smote him through the breast with a spear, that he died. Then came to the help of the Latins Lausus, the son of King Mezentius, and slew Abbas of Populonia and others also. Then the battle was equal for a space, for Pallas supported it on one side and Lausus on the other. Fair were they both to behold and of equal age, and for both it was ordained that they should not return to their native country. Yet they met not in battle, seeing that the doom of each was that he should fall by a greater hand. And now the nymph Jeturna, who was sister to Turnus, bade her brother haste to the help of Lausus, and when he was come he cried to the Latins, Give place! I only will deal with Pallas. I would that his father were here to see. Much did Pallas marvel to behold him, and to see the men give place. But, being no whit afraid, he went forth into the space between the hosts, and the blood of the Arcadians ran cold when they saw him go. Then Turnus leapt from his chariot, for he would meet him on foot and first Pallas prayed, saying, O Hercules, if thou wast indeed my father's guest, help me to-day. And Hercules heard him where he sat in heaven, and wept because he could avail nothing. Then said Father Jupiter, My son, the days of men are numbered, yet may they live for ever by noble deeds. This at least can valour do. Did not many sons of the gods fall at Troy? Yea, and my own Sarpedon, and for Turnus too the day of doom is at hand and he turned his eyes from the battle. Then Pallas cast his spear with all his might. Through the shield of Turnus it passed, and through the corslet, yea, and grazed the top of his shoulder. Then Turnus balanced his spear a while, and said, This, methinks, shall better make its way. And he cast it. Through the shield, through the stout bull's hide, and through the folds of bronze it passed, and through the corslet, and pierced the breast of Pallas from front to back and Pallas tore from the wound the reeking steel, and the blood gushed out, and the life therewith. Then Turnus stood above the corpse, and said, Men of Arcadia, tell these my words to Evander. Pallas I sent him back, even as he deserved that I should send him. I grudge him not due honours of burial, yet of a truth the friendship of Aeneas hath cost him dear. Then he put his foot upon the body, and dragged therefrom the belt. Great and heavy it was, and Clonius had wrought thereon in gold the deed of the fifty daughters of Danaeus, how they slew their husbands in one night. But even then the time was very near when Turnus would wish that he had left that spoil untouched. And afterwards, with much groaning and weeping, 
the companions of Pallas laid him upon a shield, and bare him back. And now tidings came to Aeneas that it fared ill with his men, and that Pallas was slain. Across the field he sped, and all his heart was full of wrath against Turnus, and pity for the old man Evander. And first he took alive eight youths, whom he should slay upon the tomb. Then he cast his spear at Lagus, but Lagus avoided it by craft, and rushed forward, and caught him by the knees, beseeching him by the spirit of his father, and the hopes of Iulus that he would spare him, and take a ransom for his life. But Aeneas made answer, Talk not of sparing nor of ransom, for to all courtesy of war there is an end now that Turnus hath slain Pallas. And he caught the man's helmet with his left hand, and bending back his neck, thrust in the sword up to the hilt. And many other valiant chiefs he slew, as Hemenides, priest of Phoebus and Diana, and Tarquitus, son of Faunus, and dark Camers, son of Volsens. And now there met him two brethren on one chariot, Lucagus and Liger. And Liger, who indeed drave the horses, cried aloud, These are not the horses of Diomed, nor this the chariot of Achilles, from which thou mayest escape. Lo, the end of thy battles and thy life is come. But Aeneas spake not, but cast his spear, and even as Lucagus made himself ready for battle, it sped through his shield and pierced his thigh. Then he fell dying on the plain, and Aeneas cried, mocking him, Thy horses are not slow to flee, nor frightened by a shadow. Of thine own will thou leavest thy chariot. And he caught the horses by the head. Then Liger stretched out his hands to him in supplication, saying, I beseech thee, by thy parents, have pity upon me. But Aeneas made answer, Nay, but thou spakest not thus before. Die, and desert not thy brother. And he thrust the sword into his breast. Thus did Aeneas deal death through the host, even as he had been the giant Typhius with the hundred hands. And when Iulus and the men of Troy beheld him, they broke forth from the camp. And now Juno bethought her how she might save Turnus, whom she loved. So she caused that there should pass before his eyes an image as of Aeneas, which seemed to defy him to battle. And when Turnus would have fought, lo, the false Aeneas fled, and Turnus followed him. Now there chanced to be lying moored to a great rock a certain ship, on which King Asinius had come from Clusium. Into this the false Aeneas fled, and Turnus followed hard upon him, but found not the man. And when he looked, Juno had burst the moorings of the ship, and the sea was about him on every side. Then he cried, what have I done, great Jupiter, that I should suffer such shame? What think the Latins of my flight? Drown me, ye winds and waves, or drive me where no man may see me more. Thrice he would have cast himself into the sea, thrice would he have slain himself with the sword. But Juno forbade, and brought him safe to the city of Donus, his father. In the meanwhile King Mezentius joined the battle. Nor could the men of Troy, nor yet the Tuscans, stay him. Many valiant men he slew, as Mimas, whom his mother Theano, bare the same night that Hecuba bare Paris to King Priam. And Actor, a Greek, who had left his promised wife, and carried her purple favour in his helmet. And tall Orides. Orides indeed was flying, but the king deigned not to slay him in his flight, but met him face to face and smote him. Also when Orides cried, Whoever thou art, thou goest not long unpunished. A like doom awaits thee, and in this land shalt thou find thy grave. Mezentius laughed, and made answer, Die thou, but let the king of gods and men see to me. But after a while Aeneas spied Mezentius as he fought, and made haste to meet him. Nor did the king give place, but cried, Now may this right hand and the spear which I wield be my gods, and help me. And he cast his spear. It smote the shield of Aeneas, but pierced it not. Yet did it not fly in vain, for glancing off it smote Antores in the side, Antores who once had been comrade to Hercules, and afterwards followed Evander. Now he fell, and in his death remembered the city which he loved, even Argos. Then in his turn Aeneas cast his spear. Through the bull's hide shield it passed, wounding the king in the groin, but not to death and Aeneas was right glad to see the blood flow forth, and drew his sword and pressed on. And Mezentius, much cumbered with the spear and the wound, 
gave place. But when Lausus his son saw this, he groaned aloud and leapt forward, and took the blow upon his sword, and his companions followed him with a shout, and cast their spears at Aeneas, staying him till Mezentius had gotten himself safe away. And Aeneas stood a while under the shower of spears, even as a traveller stands hiding himself from a storm. Then he cried to Lausus, What seekest thou, madman? Why venturest thou that which thy strength may not endure? But Lausus heeded him not at all, but still pressed on. Then the heart of Aeneas was filled with wrath, and the day was come for Lausus that he should die. For the king smote him with his sword. Through shield it passed, and tunic woven with gold, and was hidden to the hilt in his body. And Aeneas pitied him as he lay dead, bethinking him how he, too, would fain have died for his father, and spake, saying, What shall Aeneas give thee, unhappy boy, for this thy nobleness? Keep thy arms, in which thou hadst such delight, and let thy father care as he will for thy body, and take this comfort in thy death, that thou fallest by the hand of the great Aeneas. Then he lifted him from the earth, and bade his companions carry him away. In the meantime his father tended his wounds, leaning on the trunk of a tree by the Tiber bank. His helmet hung from a branch, and his arms lay upon the ground, while his followers stood around, and ever he asked tidings of Lausus, and sent those who should bid him return. But when they brought back his body on a shield, his father knew it from afar, and threw dust upon his white hair, and fell upon the body, crying, Had I such desire to live, my son, that I suffered thee to meet in my stead the sword of the enemy? Am I saved by these wounds? Do I live by thy death? And indeed, my son, I did dishonour to thee by my misdeeds. Would that I had given my guilty life for thine! But indeed I die. Nevertheless not yet, for I have first somewhat that I must do. Then he raised himself on his thigh, and commanded that they should bring his horse. His pride it was and comfort, and had borne him conqueror for many fights. Very sad was the beast, and he spake to it, saying, O Rebus, thou and I have lived long enough, if indeed aught on earth be long. To-day thou shalt bring back the head and the arms of Aeneas, and so avenge my Lausus, or thou shalt die with me. For a Trojan master thou wilt not, I know, endure. Then he mounted the horse, and took spears in both his hands, and so hasted to meet Aeneas. Thrice he called him by name, and Aeneas rejoiced to hear his voice, and cried, Now may Jupiter and Apollo grant that this be true. Begin the fight. And Mezentius made answer, Seek not to make afraid. Thou canst do me no harm now that thou hast slain my son. I am come to die, but take thou first this gift. And he cast his spear, and then another and yet another, as he rode in a great circle about the enemy. But they break not the boss of gold. And Aeneas stood firm, bearing the forest of spears in his shield. But at last, issuing forth in anger from behind his shield, he cast his spear, and smote the war-horse Rebus between his temples. Then the horse reared himself, and lashed the air with his feet, and fell with his rider beneath him. And the men of Troy, and the Latins, sent up a great shout. Then Aeneas hasted, and drew his sword, and stood above him, crying, Where is the fierce Mezentius now? And the king said, when he breathed again, Why threatenest thou me with death? Slay me, thou wrongest me not. I made no covenant with thee for life, nor did my Lausus when he died for me. Yet grant me this one thing. Thou knowest how my people hateth me. Keep my body, I pray thee, from them, that they do it no wrong, and let my son be buried with me in my grave. And he gave his throat to the sword, and feared not. End of chapters 21 and 22 Chapters 23 and 24 of Stories from Virgil Chapters 23 and 24 Chapter 23 The Council So the battle had an end. And the next day, early in the morning, Aeneas paid his vows, for he took an oak tree, and lopped the branches round about, and set it on a mound. And thereon he hung, for a trophy to Mars, the arms of King Mezentius, the crest dripping with blood, and the headless spears, and the corslet pierced in twelve places. Also he fastened on the left hand the shield 
and hung about the neck the ivory-hilted sword. And next, the chiefs being gathered about him, he spake, saying, We have wrought a great deed. Here ye see all that remaineth of Mezentius. Now, therefore, let us make ready to carry the war against the city of Latinus. This, therefore, will we do with the first light to-morrow. And now let us bury the dead, doing such honour to them as we may, for indeed they have purchased a country for us with their own blood. But first will I send back Pallas to the city of Evander. Then he went to the tent where the dead body was laid, and old Ascetes kept watch thereby, Ascetes who had been armour-bearer to Evander, and now had followed his son, but with evil fortune. And the women of Troy, with their hair unbound, mourned about him. But when they saw Aeneas, they beat their breasts, and sent up a great cry even to heaven. And when the king saw the pillowed head and the great wound in the breast, he wept, and said, Ah! why did fortune grudge me this, that thou shouldst see my kingdom, and go back in triumph to thy father's home? This is not what I promised to Evander when he gave thee to my charge, and warned me that the men of Italy were valiant and fierce. And now, haply, old man, thou makest offerings and prayers for him who now hath no part nor lot in the gods of heaven. Yet, at least, thou wilt see that he beareth an honourable wound. But what a son thou losest, O Italy, and what a friend thou, Iulus! Then he chose a thousand men who should go with the dead and share the father's grief. After this they made a bier of arbutus, boughs, and oak and put also over it a canopy of branches, and laid the dead thereon, like unto a flower of violet or hyacinth which a girl hath plucked, which still hath beauty and colour, but the earth nourisheth it no more. And Aeneas took two robes of purple, which Dido had woven with thread of gold, and with one he wrapped the body, and with the other the head, and behind were carried the arms which Pallas had won in fight. And they led the old man Ascetes, smiting on his breast, and tearing his cheeks, and throwing himself upon the ground. And the war-horse Ethan walked beside, with the great tears rolling down his cheeks, and also they bare behind him his helmet and shield, for all else Turnus had taken. And then followed the whole company, the men of Troy, the Arcadians, and the Tuscans, with arms reversed. And Aeneas said, The same cares and sorrows of war call me elsewhere. Farewell, my palace, for ever. And he departed to the camp. And now there came ambassadors from the city, having olive branches about their heads, praying for a truce that they might bury their dead. Then Aeneas made answer, Ye ask peace for the dead. Fain would I give it to the living. I had not come to this land but for the bidding of the fates. And if your king changeth from me and my friendship to Turnus, I am blameless. Yet methinks Turnus should rather have taken this danger upon himself. And even now, if he be willing to fight with me, man to man, so be it. But now bury ye your dead. Then they made a truce for twelve days, and the men of Troy and the Latins laboured together, hewing wood upon the hills, pine and cedar and mountain ash, and the men of Troy built great piles upon the shore, and burned the dead bodies of their companions thereon, and their arms with them and the Latins did likewise. Also they that had been chosen to do this thing carried the body of Pallas to his city. And King Evander and the Arcadians made a great mourning for him. But when they had made an end of burning the dead there arose a great tumult in the city, for many had lost husband or brother or son. Wherefore they cried out that it was an evil war, and they cursed the marriage of Turnus, and would have him fight with Aeneas man to man that there might be an end of these troubles. And lo, in the midst of the tumult there came back the ambassadors that had been sent to Diomed, saying that their prayers and gifts had availed nothing. Then King Latinus called a council of the chiefs, and sat him down upon his throne, and bade the men say on. Then Venulus, who was the chiefest among them, spake, saying, We went to Arpi, to the city of King Diomed. And the man received us, and asked us wherefore we had come. And when we had told him, he spake, saying, Men of Italy, why will ye thus tempt your fate? Know ye not that we, as many of us as lifted hand against the men of Troy, have suffered grievous things? For the lesser Ajax perished on the rocks of Euboea. 
and Menelaus was driven even to the island of Proteus, which is hard by the land of Egypt, and Ulysses scarcely escaped from the Cyclops, and as for King Agamemnon, an adulterer slew him in his palace, and us the gods suffered not to see wife or country again. But as for this which ye ask of me, I fight not against men of Troy any more. These gifts which ye bring to me, give rather to Aeneas. We have fought together, and I know how mightily he rises to the stroke of his sword, and casts his spear. I tell you this, if there had been in Troy two others such as he, the war had come to the gates of Argos, and Greece had suffered even what she wrought. "'Twas he and Hector, who for ten years bore up against our arms, both valiant men and strong, and this man the dearer to the gods. Make peace with him, if ye may, but beware that ye meet him not in war." And when they had made an end of speaking, there was a murmur in the council, some saying one thing and some another. Then King Latinus said from his throne, "'This is an ill time for counsel when the enemy is about our walls. Yet hearken to my words. Ye do ill to wage this war, for the men of Troy are dear to the gods, nor may any sword prevail against them. Ye have heard what saith King Diomed. Ye see also how low our fortunes be brought. My sentence, therefore, is this. I have a domain near to the Tiber, stretching far to the west, a land of cornfields and pasture. This, and the pine forests also on the hills, will I give to the men of Troy, and I will divide also my kingdom. But if they would rather seek some other land, let us build them twelve ships, or more, if they be able to fill them, and let them depart in peace. Now therefore let us send ambassadors, even a hundred men, and let them carry gifts, talents of gold and ivory, and also a throne and a robe, which are the emblems of kingship. Then spake Drances. Now Drances had great jealousy of Turnus. Bountiful was he, and eloquent, and skilful in counsel and debate, but feeble in fight. This matter about which thou askest us, O king, is manifest, and needeth not speech, for all men know what shall best profit the people, yet fear to say it. Tis this man that hindereth us from speech, this man for whose evil pride, ay, I will say it, though he threatens me with death, so many valiant chiefs have fallen, while he makes a vain show of his valour. And now, O king, I would bid thee add one more to thy gifts. Give thy daughter to this great son-in-law, and make peace sure for ever. Yea, Turnus, yield thou this to thy country. Lo, we all ask it of thee, even I, whom thou holdest to be thine enemy. But if thou wilt not, counting a royal wife to be more than thy country, call not on us to die for thee, but meet thy rival face to face. Then in great wrath Turnus made answer, Thou hast always many words at command, O Drances, and when the senators are called art ever first to come. But where is thy valour? Where are the trophies which thy right hand hath set up? Wilt thou make trial of it now? Lo, the enemy is at hand. Shall we go? Dost thou linger? Is all thy valour in thy boasting tongue and coward feet? And thou doubtest, forsooth, of my courage. What? Hast thou not heard of Pallas slain, and Bitius, and Pandarus, and all whom I laid low when they shut me within their walls? And now I would speak of thee and thy counsel, my father. If thou thinkest that one defeat is enough, and that fortune may not change, be it so. Let us pray for peace. Happy then he who hath died before he saw such foul disgrace. But if we have yet strength remaining, and nations and cities that will yet help us, if these men of Troy have won their victory dear, why faint we at the threshold, and tremble before the trumpet sounds? Diomed will not help us, but we have Messapus, and the augur Tolumnius, and all the chiefs of Italy, yea, and the Volscian Camilla, with her squadrons clad in bronze. And if they would have me fight man to man, I refuse not in such a cause. Let him be mighty as Achilles, and don the arms which Vulcan hath made. I refuse not the battle, for my life is for you and for your king. But while they disputed, there came a messenger unto the palace bringing tidings of fear. For the men of Troy, he said, were marching in battle line from their camp. Then there arose a great uproar, some crying aloud for arms, and some weeping. Loud was it as the clamour of birds that settle in some deep wood 
or of swans by the mouth of Poe. And Turnus cried, Call your counsels, my friends. Speak of peace as you sit, but the enemy is at the gate. And he made haste and rushed forth from the Senate House. Chapter 24 The Battle at the City Then Turnus commanded of the chiefs, some should set the battle in array, and some should fortify the gates, and some should follow after himself. And men dug trenches before the gates, and gathered store of stones and stakes, and the women and children stood upon the walls. But the queen and the chiefest of the matrons went to the temple of Pallas, and with them was the virgin Lavinia, from whom all these sorrows sprang, casting down her beautiful eyes to the ground. And they offered incense and prayer to the goddess, that she would break the Phrygian robber's spear, and lay him low before the walls of the city. Then Turnus armed himself for the battle, and ran down from the citadel, and lo, at the gate there met him Camilla with a troop of virgins riding on horses. And when they had lighted down therefrom, the queen spake, saying, I promise thee, Turnus, to meet the horsemen of Troy and of the Tuscans. Do thou abide here on foot, and guard the walls. And Turnus, steadfastly regarding her, made answer, What thanks shall I give thee for such service? But now hearken to me. There lieth a valley whereby Aeneas proposeth to come against this city. In the mouth thereof I will lay an ambush. Do thou, therefore, meet the Tuscan horsemen in battle, having with thee Messapus and the horsemen of Tiber. And when he had said this he departed, and laid the ambush against Aeneas. In the meantime Diana, where she sat in heaven, spake to Opus, who was one of the nymphs that waited on her. Camilla goeth forth to battle, who is dearer to me than all virgins beside, and hath been so even from a child. She is the daughter of King Metabus. Now Metabus, being banished from this city, even Privernum, by reason of his violence, fled, taking with him his daughter. Her he carried in his bosom, and the Volscians pressed hard upon him as he fled. And he came to the river Amasenus, and it chanced that the river was swollen with abundance of rain, and overflowed his banks, and the king, when he would have crossed it by swimming, feared for the child. Therefore he took the great spear which he carried in his hand, and bound the girl thereto with strips of bark, and balanced it in his hands, saying, I vow this child to thee, daughter of Latona, to be thy servant for ever and he cast the spear with all his might, so that it fell on the other side of the river. Then did he throw himself into the stream, and so escape from the land of his enemies. Thereafter he dwelt not in house or city, but lived on the hills with the shepherds, and the child he nourished with mare's milk, and the like. And when she could first put her feet upon the ground, he put a javelin in her hand, and gave her a bow also and arrows. No gold had she on her hair nor wore she long garments, such as women use, but was adorned with a tiger-skin. Also from a child she would cast the javelin from her hand, and whirl the sling above her head, and strike the crane or the wild swan even in the midst of the clouds. Many Tuscan mothers would have had her for their daughter-in-law, but marriage pleased her not. I would she had not come to this war. Then I had made her one of my companions, but seeing that her doom is upon her, I give thee this charge concerning her. Pass thou down to the earth, and to the Latin land, where they begin even now this evil battle, and take from thy quiver an avenging arrow, and whosoever shall harm the virgin, be he man of Troy or Italian, shall pay the penalty. But her will I carry back to her native country, neither shall any man spoil her of her arms." In the meanwhile Aeneas and his army were come near to the walls, and first the horsemen ran together against each other, holding their spears forth in front. In this battle Tyrannus the Tuscan met Acontius, and drave him from his horse with the shock, as a thunderbolt is driven from the sky or a stone from an engine, and the ranks of the Latins were troubled and fled, and the men of Troy pursued them. But when they came near to the gates, the Latins turned upon them, and the men of Troy fled in their turn even as a wave upon the shore floweth and ebbeth, so twice they fled, and twice they pursued. But the third time they joined battle, and gave not place one to the other. Then fell many men and horses dying to the ground. Orsilochus smote the horse of Remulus between the temples, and the beast reared and threw his rider to the earth. Next Catullus of Tiber slew Iolus and Herminius, 
who fought with breast and shoulders bare, driving his spear through him from side to side. But fiercest of all was the virgin Camilla, with one breast bare she fought, and now she would shoot arrows from her bow, and now would ply the battle-axe, and the virgins that were her fellows, as Lorena and Tulla and Tarpia, followed close behind her. Like to the Amazons they were, when, having their shields shaped as is the moon, they throng around their queen Penthesilea, or Hippolyte. Unius she slew, a man of Troy, and Pegasus, and Lyrus, Etruscans, and others besides. With every arrow she slew a man, and the hunter Ornitus came against her, having for helmet the head of a wolf with white teeth, and in his hand a hunting spear. He was of greater stature than other men, but she slew him, and mocked him, saying, Didst thou think, Tuscan, that thou wert hunting wild beasts this day? Lo, a woman's arms have brought thy boasts to nothing. Then she slew Orsilochus and Butus, mighty men of Troy. Butus she smote as he fled from her, but from Orsilochus she made as she would flee, then wheeling round, met him face to face, and cleft his head in twain. The son of Onus, whose father dwelt amongst the Apennines, trembled to see the deed, and was fain to escape her by craft, after the fashion of his country, being a man of Liguria. Therefore, he said, What glory is it, if thou prevailest by reason of the swiftness of thy horse? Fight with me now on foot, and let us see who shall gain the victory. And when the virgin leapt to the ground, giving her horse to her companions, he turned his horse to flee. But the virgin cried, Thinkest thou to escape me thus, thou fool? Never shalt thou see thy father, the crafty Onus, again. And she made haste, and outran the horse, and catching the reins in her hands, stood before him, and slew him. Then did Tarkin the Tuscan rebuke his horsemen, calling each by his name, and saying, What fear, what baseness is this, ye Tuscans? Shall a woman drive you before her? Ready enough are ye for the dance, and the feast, and the sacrifice, but ye lag behind in war. And he drave his horse at Venulus of Tiber, and caught him in his arms, and carried him away. As an eagle carries a snake which he hath caught, and the snake, winding his coils about the bird, struggles and hisses, so did Tarkin carry him off, and spy out a place where he might smite him, and Venulus strove amain to keep the sword from his throat, and all the men of Troy and the Tuscans charged again when they saw their chief do so valiantly. But all the while Arons watched the virgin Camilla, that he might take her unawares. Now there was a certain Chlorius, priest of Sibylle, who rode through the battle very splendid to behold for his horse was clad in bronze mail, that was clasped with gold, and he himself was clad in purple from beyond the seas. His bow was of Lycia, and his arrows of Crete. Of gold was his bow, and of gold the helmet, and his saffron scarf was clasped with gold, and his tunic was embroidered with needlework, and his trews were of diverse colors. Him alone the virgin followed, blind to all beside, with a woman's love of beautiful spoil and Aaron's watched her from the ambush where he lay, and when the time was come he cried, Apollo, Lord of Soracte, help me now. If ever I and my people have passed over the burning coals in thy honour, help me now. I seek not spoil nor glory. Let me return without honour to my country, so but I slay this fury. And part of his prayer the god heard, and part was scattered by the winds. Camilla indeed he slew, but to his country he went not back. But when the bow twanged, all the Volscians turned their eyes to the queen. But she was not aware of the arrow, even till it smote her under her breast. Then her companions ran together, and caught her as she fell, and she would have drawn forth the arrow, but it was deep in her side. Then did her eyes swim cold in death, and the color that was as the color of a rose faded from her cheek. And as she died, she said to Akka, who was dearest to her of all her companions, Akka, my sister, my strength faileth me. Bid Turnus that he join the battle, and keep the men of Troy from the city. And she loosed hold of the reins, and fell to the earth, and the battle grew fiercer as she lay. But when the nymph Opus saw that she was dead, she groaned and cried, O virgin, thou hast paid the penalty of thy deed, in that thou defiest the men of Troy. Neither hath it profited thee to be the servant of Diana. Yet will she not have thee unhonoured in thy death, 
for whosoever hath harmed thee shall surely die. Then she flew through the air, and lighted on a mound that was the tomb of Lawrence, who had once been king of the land, and when she saw Arons boasting of his deed, for at first he had fled stricken with fear, but had now taken heart again, she cried, Come hither, that thou mayest suffer thy doom, and that thou hast slain the virgin Camilla. And she drew the bow till the ends thereof came close together, and her left hand was on the arrowhead, and her right hand on the string. And even as Arons heard the clang of the bow, the arrow smote him that he died. But when Camilla was dead, her companions fled, and the Rutulians also, and the chiefs were scattered, and the battalions left desolate, and there rose a great cloud of dust that rolled ever nearer the city, and a dreadful shout went up to heaven. Then those that first came to the gates were trodden down by the crowd behind them, that they died, yea, even in the sight of their homes, and those that were within shut the gates and drave back with arms such as would have entered and then was slaughter and confusion without end. And even the women upon the walls cast javelins with their hands, and thrust with stakes of wood that had been charred with fire, even as with spears. But now there came ill tidings to Turnus, as he lay in ambush in the wood, even that Camilla was dead, and that the enemy had the mastery. Wherefore he rose up from his place, and came out upon the plain. And even as he rose up, Aeneas had won his way through the wood, and overpassed the ridge. Then did they both haste towards the walls. And Aeneas saw Turnus, and knew him, and Turnus also saw Aeneas. But the darkness hindered them that they should not fight together that day. End of chapters 23 and 24 Chapters 25 and 26 of Stories from Virgil Chapters 25 and 26 Chapter 25 The Broken Treaty Prince Turnus, seeing that the Latins had fled in the battle, and that men looked to him that he should perform that which he had promised, even to meet Aeneas face to face, was filled with rage, even as a lion which a hunter hath wounded breaketh the arrow wherewith he hath been stricken, and rouseth himself to battle, shaking his mane and roaring, so Turnus arose. And first he spake to King Latinus, saying, Not for me, my father, shall these cowards of Troy go back from that which they have covenanted. I will meet this man face to face, and slay him while ye look on. Or if the gods will that he vanquish me so, he shall rule over you, and have Lavinia to wife. But King Latinus made answer, Yet think a while, my son. Thou hast the kingdom of thy father Donus, and there are other noble virgins in Latium, whom thou mayest have to wife. Wilt thou not then be content? For to give my daughter to any husband of this nation I was forbidden, as thou knowest. Yet did I disobey, being moved by love of thee, my wife also beseeching me with many tears. Thou seest what troubles I and my people, and thou more than all, have suffered from that time. Twice have we fled in the battle, and now the city only is left to us. If I must yield me to these men, let me yield whilst thou art yet alive. For what doth it profit me that thou shouldst die? Nay, but all men would cry shame on me if I gave thee to death. Now, for a space Turnus spake not for wrath. Then he said, Be not troubled for me, my father, for I too can smite with the spear. And as for this Aeneas, his mother will not be at hand to snatch him in a cloud from my sight. Then Amata cried to him, saying, Fight not, I beseech thee, with these men of Troy, my son, for surely what thou sufferest I also shall suffer. Nor will I live to see Aeneas my son-in-law. And Lavinia heard the voice of her mother, and wept. As a man stains ivory with crimson, or as roses are seen mixed with lilies, even so the virgin's face burned with crimson, and Turnus, regarding her, loved her exceedingly, and made answer. Trouble me not with tears or idle words, my mother, for to this battle I must go. And do thou, Idmon the herald, say to the Phrygian king, To-morrow when the sun shall rise, let the people have peace, but we two will fight together, and let him that prevaileth have Lavinia to wife. Then first he went to the stalls of his horses. The wife of the north wind gave them to Pilumnus. Whiter than snow were they, and swifter than the wind. Then he put the coat of mail about his shoulders, and fitted a helmet on his head, 
and took the great sword which Vulcan had made for Daunus his father, and had dipped it when it was white-hot in the river of Styx. His spear also he took where it stood against a pillar, saying, Serve me well, my spear, that hast never failed me before, that I may lay low this womanish robber of Phrygia, and soil with dust his curled and perfumed hair. The next day the men of Italy and the men of Troy measured out a space for the battle, and in the midst they builded an altar of turf, and the two armies sat on the one side and on the other, having fixed their spears in the earth and laid down their shields. Also the women and the old men stood on the towers and roofs of the city, that they might see the fight. But Queen Juno spake to Juturna, the sister of Turnus, saying, Seest thou how these two are now about to fight face to face? and indeed Turnus goeth to his death. As for me, I endure not to look upon this covenant or this battle. But if thou canst do aught for thy brother, lo, the time is at hand. And when the nymph wept and beat her breast, Juno said, This is no time for tears. Save thy brother, if thou canst, from death, or cause that they break this covenant. After this came the kings, that they might make the covenant together. And King Latinus rode in a chariot with four horses, and he had on his head a crown with twelve rays of gold, for he was of the race of the sun. And Turnus came in a chariot with two white horses, having a javelin in either hand. And Aeneas had donned the arms which Vulcan had made, and with him was the young Iulus. And after due offering Aeneas sware, calling on all the gods, If the victory shall fall this day to Turnus, the men of Troy shall depart to the city of Evander, nor trouble this land any more. But if it fall to me, I will not that the Latins should serve the men of Troy. Let the nations be equal one with the other. The gods that I bring we will worship together, but King Latinus shall reign as before. A new city shall the men of Troy build for me, and Lavinia shall call it after her own name. Then King Latinus swear, calling on the gods that are above, and the gods that are below, saying, This covenant shall stand for ever, whatsoever may befall. As sure as this sceptre which I bear, once it was a tree, but a cunning workman closed it in bronze, to be the glory of Latium's kings, shall never again bear twig or leaf, so surely shall this covenant be kept. But the thing pleased not the Latins, for before, indeed, they judged that the battle would not be equal between the two and now were they the more assured, seeing them when they came together, and that Turnus walked with eyes cast to the ground, and was pale and wan. Wherefore there arose a murmuring among the people, which, when Juturna perceived, she took upon herself the likeness of Camers, who was a prince and a great warrior among them, and passed through the host, saying, Are ye not ashamed, men of Italy, that one man should do battle for you all? For count these men, Surely they are scarce one against two, and if he be vanquished, what shame for you! As for him, indeed, though he die, yet shall his glory reach to the heavens. But ye shall suffer disgrace, serving these strangers for ever. And when she saw that the people were moved, she gave also a sign from heaven, for lo, an eagle that drave a crowd of sea-fowl before him, swooped down to the water, and caught a great swan. And even while the Italians looked, the birds that before had fled turned and pursued the eagle, and drave him before them, so that he dropped the swan and fled away. Which thing, when the Italians perceived, they shouted, and made them ready for battle. And the augur, Tolumnius, cried, This is the token that I have looked for, for this eagle is the stranger, and ye are the birds which before indeed have fled, but shall now make him to flee. And he ran forward, and cast his spear, smiting a man of Arcadia below the belt, upon the groin. One of nine brothers was he, sons of a Tuscan mother. But their father was a Greek, and they, when they saw him slain, caught swords and spears, and ran forward. And straightway the battle was begun. First they break down the altars, that they might make firebrands therefrom, and King Latinus fled from the place. Then did Messapus drive his horses against King Olestes of Mantua, who, being fain to fly, stumbled upon the altar, and fell headlong on the ground. And Messapus smote him with a spear that was like a weaver's beam, saying, This of a truth is worthier victim. After this, Corinius the Arcadian, when Ibyssus 
would have smitten him, snatched a brand from the altar, and set fire to the beard of the man, and before he came to himself caught him by the hair, and thrusting him to the ground so slew him. And when Podalirius pursued Alsus the shepherd, and now held his sword over him ready to strike, the other turned, and with a battle-axe cleft the man's head from forehead to chin. But all the while the righteous Aeneas, having his head bare, and holding neither spear nor sword, cried to the people, What seek ye? What madness is this? The covenant is established, and I only have the right to do battle. But even while he spake, an arrow smote him, wounding him. But who let it fly no man knoweth, for who of a truth would boast that he had wounded Aeneas? And he departed from the battle. CHAPTER Twenty Six, THE DEATH OF TURNUS Now when Turnus saw that Aeneas had departed from the battle, he called for his chariot, and when he had mounted thereon he drave it through the host of the enemy, slaying many valiant heroes, as Sthenelus and Pholus, and the two sons of Imbrasus, the Lycian, Glaucus, and ladies. Then he saw Eumedes, son of that Dolon who would have spied out the camp of the Greeks, asking as his reward the horses of Achilles. But Diomed slew him. Turnus smote with a javelin from afar, and when he fell came near and put his foot upon him, and taking his sword drave it into his neck, saying, Lo, now thou hast the land which thou soughtest. Lie there, and measure out Italy for thyself. Many others he slew, for the army fled before him. Yet did one man, Phegeus by name, stand against him, and would have stayed the chariot, catching the bridles of the horses in his hand. But as he clung to the yoke and was dragged along, Turnus broke his cuirass with his spear and wounded him. And when the man set his shield before him, and made at Turnus with his sword, the wheels dashed him to the ground, and Turnus struck him between the helmet and the breastplate, and smote off his head. But in the meanwhile Menestheus and Achates and Iulus led Aeneas to the camp, leaning on his spear. Very wrath was he, and strove to draw forth the arrow, and when he could not he commanded that they should open the wound with the knife, and so send him back to the battle. Iapis also the physician ministered to him. Now this Iapis was dearer than all other men to Apollo, and when the god would have given him all his arts, even prophecy and music and archery, he chose rather to know the virtues of herbs and the art of healing that so he might prolong the life of his father, who was even ready to die. This Iapis, then having his garments girt about him in healer's fashion, would have drawn forth the arrow with the pincers, but could not. And while he strove, the battle came nearer, and the sky was hidden by clouds of dust, and javelins fell thick into the camp. But when Venus saw how grievously her son was troubled, she brought from Ida, which is a mountain of Crete, the herb Dittany. A hairy stalk it hath, and a purple flower. The wild goats know it well, if so be that they have been wounded by arrows. This then Venus, having hidden her face, brought and dipped into the water, and sprinkled there with ambrosia and sweet-smelling panacea. And Iapis, unawares, applied the water that had been healed, and, lo, the pain was stayed and the blood was staunched, and the arrow came forth, though no man drew it, and Aeneas's strength came back to him, as before. Then said Iapis, Art of mine hath not healed thee, my son, the gods call thee to thy work. Then did Aeneas arm himself again, and when he had kissed Iulus and bidden him farewell, he went forth to the battle, and all the chiefs went with him, and the men of Troy took courage and drave back the Latins. Then befell a great slaughter, for Gaius slew Euphens, who was the leader of the Equians. Also, Tolumnius, the great augur, was slain, who had first broken the covenant, slaying a man with his spear. But Aeneas deigned not to turn his hand against any man, seeking only for Turnus, that he might fight with him. But when the nymph Juturna perceived this, she was sore afraid. Therefore she came near to the chariot of her brother, and thrust out Metiscus, his charioteer, where he held the reins, and herself stood in his room, having made herself like to him in shape and voice. Then, as a swallow flies through the halls and arcades of some rich man's house, seeking food for its young, so Juturna drave the chariot of her brother hither and thither, and ever Aeneas followed behind, and called to him that he should stay. But whenever he espied the man, and would have overtaken him by running, then again did Juturna turn the horses about and flee. 
and as he sped, Messippus cast a spear at him. But Aeneas saw it coming, and put his shield over him, resting on his knee. Yet did the spear smite him on the helmet-top, and shear off the crest. Then indeed was his wrath kindled, and he rushed into the army of the enemy, slaying many as he went. Then was there a great slaughter made on this side and on that. But after a while Venus put it into the heart of Aeneas that he should lead his army against the city. Therefore he called together the chiefs, and, standing in the midst of them on a mound, spake, saying, Hearken now to my words, and delay not to fulfill them. For of a truth Jupiter is on our side. I am purposed this day to lay this city of Latinus, even with the ground, if they still refuse to obey. For why should I wait for Turnus till it please him to meet me in battle? Then did the whole array make for the walls of the city, and some carried firebrands, and some scaling ladders, and some slew the warders at the gates, and cast javelins at them who stood on the walls. And then there arose a great strife in the city, for some would have opened the gates that the men of Troy might enter, and others made haste to defend the walls. Hither and thither did they run with much tumult, even as bees in a hive in a rock which a shepherd hath filled with smoke, having first shut all the doors thereof. Then also did other ill fortune befall the Latins, for when Queen Amata saw from the roof of the palace that the enemy were come near to the walls, and saw not anywhere the army of the Latins, she supposed Turnus to have fallen in the battle. Whereupon, crying out that she was the cause of all these woes, she made a noose of the purple garment wherewith she was clad, and hanged herself from a beam of the roof. Then did lamentation go through the city, for the women wailed and tore their hair, and King Latinus rent his clothes, and threw dust upon his head. But the cry that went up from the city came to the ears of Turnus where he fought in the furthest part of the plain, and he caught the reins, and said, What meaneth this sound of trouble and wailing that I hear? And the false Metiscus, who was in truth his sister, made answer, Let us fight, O Turnus, here where the gods give us victory. There are enough to defend the city. But Turnus spake, saying, Nay, my sister, for who thou art I have known even from the beginning, it must not be so. Why camest thou down from heaven? Was it to see thy brother die? And now what shall I do? Have I not seen Morenus die, and Euphens the Equian? And shall I suffer this city to be destroyed? Shall this land see Turnus flee before his enemies? Be ye kind to me, O gods of the dead, seeing that the gods of heaven hate me. I come down to you a righteous spirit, and not unworthy of my fathers. And even as he spake came Saces, riding on a horse that was covered with foam, and on his face was the wound of an arrow. And he cried, O Turnus, our last hopes are in thee. For Aeneas is about to destroy the city, and the firebrands are cast upon the roofs. And King Latinus is sore tried with doubt and the queen hath laid hands upon herself, and is dead. And now only Messippus and Atenus maintain the battle, and the fight grows fierce around them, while thou drivest thy chariot about these empty fields. Then for a while Turnus stood speechless, and shame and grief and madness were in his soul, and he looked to the city, and, lo, the fire went up even to the top of the tower which he himself had builded upon the walls to be a defence against the enemy. And when he saw it, he cried, It is enough, my sister. I go whither the gods call me. I will meet with Aeneas face to face, and endure my doom. And as he spake he leapt down from his chariot, and ran across the plain, till he came near to the city, even where the blood was deepest upon the earth, and the arrows were thickest in the air. And he beckoned with the hand, and called to the Italians, saying, Stay now your arrows. I am come to fight this battle for you all and when they heard it they left a space in the midst. Aeneas also, when he heard the name of Turnus, left attacking the city, and came to meet him, mighty as Athos, or Eryx, or Father Apenninus, that raiseth his snowy head to the heavens. And the men of Troy and the Latins and King Latinus marvelled to see them, so mighty were they. First they cast their spears at each other, and then ran together, and their shields struck one against the other with a crash that went up to the sky and Jupiter held the balance in heaven, weighing their doom. Then Turnus, rising to the stroke, smote fiercely with his sword. And the men of Troy and the Latins cried out when they saw him strike. But the treacherous sword brake in the blow, 
and when he saw the empty hilt in his hand he turned to flee. They say that when he mounted his chariot that day to enter the battle, not heeding the matter in his haste, he left his father's sword behind him, and took the sword of Metiscus, which, indeed, served him well while the men of Troy fled before him, but break even as ice breaks when it came to the shield which Vulcan had made. Thereupon Turnus fled, and Aeneas, though the wound which the arrow had made hindered him, pursued. Even as a hound follows a stag that is penned within some narrow space, for the beast flies hither and thither, and the staunch Umbrian hound follows close upon him, and almost holds him, and snaps his teeth, yet bites him not, so did Aeneas follow hard on Turnus, and still Turnus cried out, that some one should give him his sword, and Aeneas threatened that he would destroy the city if any should help him. Five times about the space they ran, not for some prize they strove, but for the life of Turnus. Now there stood in the plain the stump of a wild olive tree. The tree was sacred to Faunus, but the men of Troy had cut it, and the stump only was left. Herein the spear of Aeneas was fixed, and now he would have drawn it forth that he might slay Turnus therewith, seeing that he could not overtake him by running. Which when Turnus perceived he cried to Faunus, saying, O Faunus, if I have kept holy for thee that which the men of Troy have profaned, hold fast this spear. And the god heard him, nor could Aeneas draw it forth. But while he strove, Juturna, taking again the form of Metiscus, ran and gave to Turnus his sword. And Venus, perceiving it, wrenched forth the spear from the stump. So the two stood again face to face. Then spake Jupiter to Juno, where she sat in a cloud watching the battle. How long wilt thou fight against fate? What purpose hast thou now in thy heart? Was it well that Juturna, for what could she avail without thy help, should give back to Turnus his sword? Thou hast driven the men of Troy over land and sea, kindled a dreadful war, and mingled the song of marriage with mourning. Further thou mayest not go. And Juno humbly made her answer, This is thy will, great father, else had I not sat here but stood in the battle smiting the men of Troy. And indeed I spake to Juturna that she should help her brother, but aught else I know not. And now I yield. Yet grant me this, suffer not that the Latins should be called after the name of Troy, nor change their speech nor their garb. Let Rome rule the world, but let Troy perish for ever. Then spake with a smile the Maker of all things, Truly, Thou art a daughter of Saturn, so fierce is the wrath of thy soul. And now what thou prayest I give. The Italians shall not change name, nor speech, nor garb. The men of Troy shall mingle with them, and I will give them a new worship, and call them all Latins, nor shall any race pay thee more honor than they. Then Jupiter sent a fury from the pit, and she took the form of a bird, even of an owl that sitteth by night on the roof of a desolate house, and flew before the face of Turnus, and flapped her wings against his shield. Then was Turnus stricken with great fear, so that his hair stood up, and his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth. And when Juturna knew the sound of the false bird, what it was, she cried aloud for fear, and left her brother, and fled, hiding herself in the river of Tiber. But Aeneas came on, shaking his spear that was like unto a tree, and said, Why delayest thou, O Turnus? Why drawest thou back? Fly now, if thou canst, through the air, or hide thyself in the earth. And Turnus made answer, I fear not thy threats, but the gods and Jupiter that are against me this day. And as he spake he saw a great stone which lay hard by, the landmark of a field. Scarce could twelve chosen men, such as men are now, lift it on their shoulders. This he caught from the earth, and cast it at his enemy, running forward as he cast. But he knew not, so troubled was he in his soul, that he ran, or that he cast, for his knees tottered beneath him, and his blood grew cold with fear. And the stone fell short, nor reached the mark. Even as in a dream, when dull sleep is on the eyes of a man, he would fain run, but cannot, for his strength faileth him, neither cometh there any voice when he would speak. So it fared with Turnus for he looked to the Latins, and to the city, and saw the dreadful spear approach, nor knew how he might fly, neither how he might fight, and could not spy anywhere his chariot or his sister. And all the while Aeneas shook his spear, and waited that his aim should be sure. And at the last he threw it with all his might. 
even as a whirlwind it flew, and brake through the seven folds of the shield, and pierced the thigh. And Turnus dropped with his knee bent to the ground, and all the Latins groaned aloud to see him fall. Then he entreated Aeneas, saying, I have deserved my fate. Take thou that which thou hast won. Yet perchance thou mayest have pity on the old man, my father, even Donus, for such an one was thy father Anchises, and give me back to my own people, if it be but my body that thou givest. Yet hast thou conquered, and the Latins have seen me beg my life of thee, and Lavinia is thine. Therefore, I pray thee, stay now thy wrath. Then for a while Aeneas stood doubting. I, and might have spared the man, when, lo, he spied upon his shoulders the belt of Pallas, whom he had slain, and his wrath was greatly kindled, and he cried with a dreadful voice, Shalt thou who art clothed with the spoils of my friends escape me? Tis Pallas slays thee with this wound, and takes vengeance on thy accursed blood. And as he spake he drave the steel into his breast, and with a groan the wrathful spirit passed into darkness. End of chapters 25 and 26 And End of Stories from Virgil